Aloha, we're at uh, Church of the Crossroads. We're about to start the uh, program. I thought I'd crank it up a little early. That's uh, Nancy Alec in front of us, uh, Executive Director of the Hawaii People's Fund, who has supports Hawaii Guerrilla Video Hui by <laughs> granting them cash from time to time. <laughs> presentation is going to be by Jeff Patterson, who uh, I guess we'll hear more about him, but some of us remember him from 1990, the first Iraq war. It's too bad there have been so many, but this Middle East situation didn't happen overnight. So here we go, Nancy L. Aloha everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, sorry we're getting started a little bit late. One of our speakers is not here yet, but um, we can work around that. Um, this event, I want to say it's locally sponsored by the ACLU Foundation of Hawaii, Hawaii Peace and Justice, Hawaii People's Fund, Revolution Books, Honolulu, World Can't Wait Hawaii, and also I'd like to acknowledge the Church of the Crossroads. Um, overall, our host is the Chelsea Manning Support Network and Courage to Resist. I think it's important for us to really take that concept in, courage to resist. We're going to be hearing a lot about that tonight. I'm Nancy Alec with Hawaii People's Fund. We're a public foundation that supports justice and social change. Since 1972, the People's Fund has been there as an ally and a resource for unpopular causes. Standing firm and speaking out against war and militarism can be lonely, isolating, and even dangerous, especially in such a heavily militarized place like Hawaii. Tonight, we'll hear from three people who have the courage to resist. We'll hear from each of them, and then we'll take questions after everyone has spoken. Um, before you get too comfortable, sir, <laughs> You're first on the list. Is that okay? <laughs> um, first is Kyle Kajihiro, who is the most fully informed and outspoken activism regarding the military in Hawaii, the octopus and its multi legged impacts. So, welcome, Kyle Kajihiro. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, um, yeah, we have the swim, swim practice after school and work and stuff, so it's a rush to get here. Um, so I uh, want to thank uh, Church of the Crossroads, uh, Jeff, uh, Nancy, uh, Jake, um, you know, it's an honor to be here, and I was, I was just asked to talk about um, the military situation in Hawaii, it's kind of a quick update, so I just want to, uh, first thing I want to say is just, uh, it's important to situate the military uh, historically um, and to recognize that Hawaii was uh, a fulcrum of uh, the U.S. military, the first military pivot uh, of American empire from a continental empire to uh, one that spanned uh, two oceans um, and that used uh, the geography of Hawaii, its geopolitical location, its, um, its uh, unique uh, resource, ge geographic resources, namely Kiabalao Pu'uloa, or Pearl Harbor, as most people know it today. Uh, use that as the, the um, uh, geography to, uh, with which to expand American power, right, from, from the west coast of North America, um, and leverage that power to reach uh, the shores of um, Asia, and, and China was the prize at that time. So just to kind of keep that in mind, and as a result, um, Hawaii became both a, a casualty of American empire and um, an accessory to the crimes of that empire. And so this is the kind of the dual, the contradictory um, role and function that we play in, in uh, present day geopolitics that I think we just have to be mindful of. While we're addressing the problems uh, that the military has caused in the islands, uh, the uh, unlawful uh, occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom and independent 
kingdom, the taking of lands which are still used for military training, uh, uh, the, the cost of the environment, uh, culture, and so forth, but also what that training is used for and who it's used for against. Um, you know, the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, uh, Vietnam before that, Korea. Uh, these were skills and techniques that were perfected um, using uh, our lands here in Hawaii. So we have two kuleana to address that. Um, and Nancy mentioned the, the octopus, so that's the, the next point I want to make is just um, using that metaphor of the hee, uh, a, a monstrous octopus. Kaleko Kaeo described um, Hawaii as the head of this octopus. So if you can kind of just keep that image in mind, um, and uh, that brain of this octopus would be the Pacific Command headquarters up in Halawa Heights, right, which is the head. The headquarters of the U.S. Pacific Command, the largest and oldest of the United um, States uh, Unified Commands. Uh, its area of responsibility goes from the west coast of North America to the central Indian Ocean, from Alaska all the way to and including Antarctica. So most of the of the surface of the planet, majority of the world's population falls within this um, U.S. Pacific Command. Um, but that that nervous system of this hey, would be the supercomputers and fiber optics that, that connect it all together, right? Uh, what, what are the eyes of this octopus? Uh, if you look up at the top of our mountains, uh, Haleakala, uh, Koke'e, Ka'ala, Ka'ena Point, uh, you'll see ray domes and tracking stations. So these are all the sensors that are um, watching. They're watching things in space. They're watching things flying around. They're tracking objects. Uh, they're used to train um, and, and, and practice uh, missile launches. Uh, so these are the eyes that are that are of this octopus. Um, its ears would be um, if you ever drive out to Wahiwa, past Wahiwa Town, and you get Whitmore Village on the right, um, tucked away there in the old pineapple fields, kind of buried into um, the rock, the bedrock, is a, a, the Naval Master Communications um, Computer and, and Telecommunications Master Center, uh, as well as the National Security Agency listening post. So, Regional Signals Intelligence Center is in that site. It's sort of hard to see because it's behind a lot of grass, tall grass and um, koahaole, but um, it's, it's in there. And, and look, you see these dishes, right? So they're listening. They're listening. Cell phones, uh, emails, all that stuff is being scooped up. And uh, this is where Edward Snowden worked. Um, the, the excrement, the, the kukai of this, of this hay. Um, can be um, symbolized by the toxic shadow, the toxic stain that has been left behind in our landscape. Um, and Kiavalao Kuuloa Pearl Harbor would be sort of emblematic of that. Uh, something like 750 contaminated sites within the Pearl Harbor complex alone. I would estimate there's over a thousand contaminated sites throughout the islands, right? Everything from unexploded ordnance to depleted uranium. Uh, radioactive cobalt-60 in the sediment of Pearl Harbor. Um, there's several um, uh, plumes of diesel fuel, jet fuel, um, even uh, perchloroethylene and other solvents uh, on the water table. Um, uh, substances like mercury and lead, uh, uh, ash from uh, landfills uh, in, in Manana and Waipio. Uh, these have uh, Toxic carcinogens like dioxins um, and PCBs. Uh, so we have we have the, the, the excrement of this monstrosity uh, that continues to live on even after those, a lot of those lands have been uh, decommissioned as military active military sites. Um, and then, of course, the, the octopus has its tentacles, and so we can see these tentacles uh, reaching out across the Pacific. Um, they are grabbing at our brothers and sisters around the region in uh, Guam, in the Marshall Islands, uh, in Okinawa, where there's a tremendous struggle right now to oust the, the uh, Marine Corps base and to pre prevent the expansion of a base in Hinoko, uh, in Korea, in Japan, uh, even all the way to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, where a whole population was, was evicted in order to make way for one of the most strategic U.S. Uh, bases in the, in the planet. Um, and so uh, these are the tentacles, 
And um, if you're a fisherman and you've ever caught he'e, you know that if you, you cut off a tentacle of a, of a he'e um, and the thing gets away, it'll grow back. Right? So if you look at what happened to the Philippines, um, U.S. bases were expelled over 20 years ago. And after September 11, uh, we've seen special forces uh, come back into uh, the southern Philippines to do training and advising uh, in the counterterrorism uh, activities. And then soon after that, there's an expanded visiting forces agreement. Um, and now uh, an enhanced visiting forces agreement, which allows the U.S. to utilize pretty much um, most uh, Philippines bases. Um, so it's sort of like pre-positioning and using it um, on demand. Have on demand military bases. So the US doesn't have to manage or take care of, of the facilities. They just utilize a, another country's base um, and then um, come in and, and set up shop and activate um, when they need to. So this is the new model of military basing that's happening, you know, to sort of have these austere uh, remote bases that can be activated at will when it's needed. And that way it's less overhead, but it creates this spatially um, comprehensive uh, network of bases that can be used. So it's very strategic in that sense. Um, and it goes along with the, the new emphasis on um, technologies of, of space, um, technology, satellites, and, and all of that, and the communication systems that are out there. Uh, and then those, of course, network with drones, right? So the remote control killing that's become so prominent under the Obama administration is the new way. And it uses these austere sites as part of that network for for coordinating your activities. So um, this is the tentacles, and this is what we have to also be mindful of. Um, just briefly, what it means for Oahu, or for Hawaii itself, is that today um, about 230,000 acres of, of land are under military control. Uh, on the island of Oahu, 24.6% uh, of the island is military control. Uh, so that's a pretty large amount. I mean, I think the only comparable places are Okinawa and uh, Guam, which are about similar percentage-wise. So, um, you know, that, for a small island to have that large percentage of land um, controlled by the military, uh, and most of that land are the Hawaiian city lands or the Hawaiian kingdom lands that were wrongfully taken, uh, we still have an active problem, right? The overthrow is still with us. It's still, um, it's, it's not, it's not a thing of the past. Um, it has present consequences. And that's why we have this troubled relationship with the military in Hawaii, right? Around land use, around sovereignty, and so forth. Um, just um, a, a couple of the sites where uh, things are happening right now. Mako Valley, we've had we've just celebrated 10 years of no life fire training, thanks to the work of Malama Makoa, the law hey. But the Army is, in fact, this week there's some meetings where the Army is talking about their environmental studies and they're hoping to get the approval to begin training, to resume training. And so this is a, a fight that we have to um, pay attention to and support when, when the call comes. Um, uh, Pohakuloa, of course, is the site for most of the expansion in Hawaii. And so uh, Ku Ching and Maxim uh, Kahaleliu are uh, both plaintiffs in a lawsuit challenging the state of Hawaii to do a better job of protecting those lands, which are basically the ceded lands, the Hawaiian land assets, uh, from the military. Mo uh, thousands of acres up there are leased from the state to the US military for 65 years for a dollar, right? <laughs> um, so I could, you know, that's a pretty good deal, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so we want to end those leases. They come due in 2029, but we say enough already, cut it off. So anyway, this lawsuit is going on. Um, but meanwhile, the expansion is happening up there. Um, there's been uh, the, other, the other expansion threat that's happening is with the Marine Corps. They're one of the, the forces that are expanding tremendously throughout the Pacific. So, um, Mokapu is a uh, Kamehameha Marine Base. It's one site that's slated for the expansion of these Osprey uh, tilt rotor aircraft. So, they look like helicopters um, that can tilt their rotors this way and fly like an airplane, right? Um, very dangerous, very expensive. Uh, the government didn't want it, but the Marine Corps kept slipping it into their budget and keeping it alive. And so there's about 28 of these, I think, that's supposed to come to Hawaii. Uh, it's not going to only be limited to Mokapu. They want to train everywhere from Kauai all the way to Pohakuloa and Big Island, uh, including Molokai and some places. So there's been some shifts in their plans, but it could affect many parts of the island uh, when, when and if they come. 
as well as they've destroyed some Hawaiian cultural sites on Mokapu to build, to expand the hangar for these, these monstrous aircraft. So that's been a fight that some of the families from that area have been waging. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to stop those expansions from happening, so it's still proceeding. Um, some good news is in uh, Waikani Valley, on the Windward side, uh, the, uh, the military leased those lands from the Kamaka family during World War II, promised to return it after the war and clean it up. Um, the lands came back, but they were contaminated, and so the Marine Corps condemned about 179 acres of the Kamaka family lands there. Uh, Uncle Raymond Kamaka fought this for many years. He just passed away last year. But the good news is his vision of, of getting those lands cleaned up is proceeding. And so I, I sit on a restoration advisory board that, that has been pushing the, the Marine Corps to clean it up to the highest level possible. And, and it looks like it will be possible for at least the productive lands near the, the stream bed, the, the flat areas that could be farmed again. It looks like those areas could be uh, cleaned up to uh, unrestricted use standard of, of cleanup, which is very good. Um, some of the slopes are hard to get to, and those will be still hazardous. But uh, we look forward to the time when those lands can come back. So that's not a question at this time, but the community is still pushing for that to happen in the future. Um, and then just the, the last thing I'll talk about is just the, um, there's um, been some uh, news about the Army potentially downsizing in Hawaii. So some of us, of course, celebrate that possibility and are encouraging that to happen. Uh, the business community, many of the politicians and some unions are, are very much against it, and they've been organizing to, um, to what is it, uh, save our, uh, not save our heroes, uh, something like that. Keep our heroes. Keep our heroes. The heroes need saving. Um, so um, anyway, it's, so that's a, an interesting situation because it's a convergence of a number of things. Because on the one hand, you say, well, if the military is expanding, if Obama's doing this pivot to the Pacific, right, to counter China and, and rebalance all their military forces, why is there a downsizing underway? So it's, it's a couple of things, I think. One is the budget crisis the U.S. is in. They're, they're finally having to make cuts in the military budget. So it's hitting the Army probably the hardest. They have to make a 100,000 troop cut across the board, They're looking at 30 bases where it could happen, and about 19,800 troops could potentially be cut from bases in Hawaii, Schofield and Shafter. Okay. So it's been, they're in the process of studying that. The other thing that's going on is the Army is sort of becoming obsolete, at least in the way it's been configured in the past. It's, it's not the kind of wars that are happening anymore, right? It's like drones with special forces, and more exp expeditionary kinds of warfare. So more of the burden is shifting to these special forces, one of the resources, and also the Marine Corps. And so the Army is trying to fight for its relevance in this new era um, and hold on to its assets. But meanwhile, the, the momentum or the shifting of priorities is forcing them to make some of the hardest cuts. So I think that's another thing that's happening with some of the, um, um, one of the proponents of the, uh, the Army downsizing has been, that's part of his analysis. The other thing is that, um, so some of the countervailing forces though, is that because Obama has announced this pivot, because he has this tie to Hawaii, there's a lot of symbolic, cap, you know, sort of capital resting on him showing that Hawaii is still very important for the military. So even though it's from a military standpoint, it's, it's far away for an army, it's very hard to deploy. A lot of army troops with their big tanks, their strikers, uh, to, to a fighting area. Uh, it's just it's, um, effective to deploy from some place like um, Washington or, or another location. Despite all of that, um, to, to show that the army is downsizing in a place like Hawaii would signal, would send the wrong geopolitical signal. And so that countervails this downside. So we don't know how that's gonna balance out. Um, the, other, the other factor is that we're, we're, this is one of the first events of the post Inoue era. So the army, the military in Hawaii has been sort of artificially propped up in many ways because of the political economy of, of the, the military, you know, political machine. Um, and Senator Inoue single-handedly, his institution, right, so he had so much clout to be able to leverage money into projects that often the military didn't request or didn't want, right? The Pentagon didn't request many projects. Uh, $80 million for a new Pacific Command Headquarters facility. Um, they didn't request it, but Senator Inouye you know, said, you're gonna want this, and he stuck it in the budget. So that's how a lot of these projects happen. You, you notice a lot of construction on military bases. It's sort of driven by those types of political, economic considerations. With him not there, um, 
the, the new congressional representatives from Hawaii are trying to position themselves to be strategic in Washington, but they have low, you know, they don't have as much clout, right? Um, and so there's going to be po politics that are pulling money to other places. And I think rather than see that and um, approach that with fear and dread, I think it's an opportunity that we should embrace and figure out how do we move forward to try to transition Hawaii from this military dependent economy to something else that's um, forward looking and that utilizes our assets uh, and builds up our capacities for the future. So I'll just stop there and thank you for it. So she's giving me the mic back and forth. Thank you, Liz. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce next First Lieutenant Jacob Bridge. It's rare that an individual still on active duty will speak out. Jacob Bridge is awaiting approval of his application as a conscientious objector. So let's recognize his courage as we welcome him. Jacob Bridge.
personal like training better because then you really knew what people stood for. And it seemed to me that out here a lot of times, the leaders that I've worked with, um, my peers and the people I worked for, it seemed to me that they were operating under the do as I say, not as I do principle, which was really disturbing to me and uh, was a big problem that I couldn't reconcile on it. So I started seeing a therapist. I've been seeing a therapist for other reasons since 2010. So um, from March to October or September, I was doing a lot of thinking and just soul searching, wondering what I could do. I wanted to fix the Marine Corps. That was my big thing, was I wanted to fix the Marine Corps. I would, darn it, I would just make everybody good again. And uh, I mean, I, I had seen leaders treat their subordinates like garbage. And these are people with families. Some of my peers, I knew one that would buy prostitutes regularly. People would drink and drive and then come to work and uh, chastise and punish Marines who had been caught doing the same thing. And that really did not sit well with me. So um, I had to think, I had to read, I had to meditate. Um, and then in September 13, September of 2013, I was watching a documentary on Buddhism, which wasn't something I did often back then. Um, but it just happened to be on, and I watched it. And I was learning about Buddha, and I was kind of shocked that this guy was around 2,000 years ago, but all these things he was talking about equality, racial equality, uh, gender equality, um, equality among spiritual practices and religions. I had never heard of something like that where somebody would say, like, oh, they're all good, instead of saying mine's the right one, and you have to follow mine. Um, but there was one thing he said that really stuck with me, and I couldn't reconcile it, and I know enough now after being in therapy for so long, that when I can't reconcile something, I don't let it fade away because then it comes back and bites me years later and it hurts. Uh, so I keep it up here until I can figure it out and put it in its proper place. It was violence begets violence. And I didn't get it. It sounded right, but I didn't get it because I've been taught that we use violence in the military to solve violence. There's a violent problem in Afghanistan. We're going to go kill it. There's violent problems all over the world. We're just going to go kill it with our own violence and everything will be great because that's the, that's what I thought was the American way. Um, eventually, in the next months, while I was thinking, reading, listening, talking, um, I started seeing that he was right. And I was wrong. We were wrong. So then that was that was a problem. It was, so he gets violence, he gets violence. The question to me became, then, what am I doing? I'm here to help America. I'm here to help other people. But if violence begets violence, I don't know that I'm helping anyone. Um, so that was a big, a big problem for me. And then around March 2014, I began realizing just because I'm involved um, and I care about some of my Marines who are LGBT, that uh, the Marine Corps and my unit specifically wasn't going to recognize Pride Month, even though they had no reason not to, except that they hadn't been directly ordered to do it. And I got involved with the Pride Month push. And, uh, Eventually, I requested masks, which is essentially saying um, you talk to your boss and your boss's boss and your boss's boss's boss until you get somebody who can address your problem and fix it. Um, and eventually, myself and another officer were able to get the majority of Marine forces in the Pacific to recognize Pride Month in June of 2014. It wasn't much, but it was something. It's a precedent that they're going to have to follow now. Um, they can't march that one back. But that led me on to the question of if we can't even treat our own Marines, sailors, soldiers, with respect and with the um, with the respect that they're due, how can we be trusted to make decisions on who we're going to kill in a country that we've never been to before? We can't even treat our own people well. Um, these were just all these questions that kept adding up, adding up until um, May twentieth. I woke up in the middle of the night from a dream uh, that I can't really describe, except that I woke up and I remembered that someday I'm going to die, and that there's just no time to waste. There was no time to waste doing anything I didn't like to do, and I definitely wasn't going to be a part of killing anybody anymore. And I woke up, and one of the first things I thought was, oh yeah, conscientious objective, just do that. And the next day, um, I found my chaplain, and I told her it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when, and to expect my application. So over the next couple weeks, um, I was furious in writing my application. And on June 16th, I submitted it to my command. Uh, and after hearing all the horror stories, I had thought that it was going to be Pretty awful, but I knew that I had to approach it in a way that wasn't offensive and that wasn't, you know, demanding certain things. I was kind of approaching with the attitude that 
uh, I'm going to get what you're going to give me. And I didn't really have any ground to stand on. I was kind of at their mercy. So luckily, I've been treated a lot better than I thought. Um, I begin a job that doesn't conflict so much with my views. Um, I have found that some people do treat me differently uh, because, as ironic as it sounds, they're a little bit scared of my opinions. Although I think it's very strange that being somebody who doesn't want to kill anymore can be terrifying to anybody. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, the people who, you know, kind of looked at me like, at first, once they got to talking to me again and working with me, they realized I'm still the same Jake. Um, I just did something they don't understand, but I think eventually they will, and I'm not offensive about it, and I don't expect everybody to have the same views or opinions as me, and I'm not angry that they don't. The best way I've had to put is that we wouldn't know, we only know what North is in relation to South, and the same thing for East to West. So if they weren't so staunchly opposed to the things I hold dear, I wouldn't know what I believe. That's kind of how I go. Is I know that they really think that way, and I hate it. I disagree. So I know who I am. So sometimes when I'm really in the middle of a debate, I just like to thank the people and then leave it that. Um, I knew then, though, June 16th, that I had about a half tank of gas left as far as motivation goes for this job, and I could wait until December for a decision. Um, as you can see, I made it through December, um, so I was kind of running on fumes in January. At this point, I feel like I'm out of the car and pushing, <laughs> but I've got a, uh, you know, I've got a good support network now. I've met Jeff, and I've had a support network the whole way, and now I kind of feel like you guys are here helping me push the car, too. So thank you all for uh, coming out and just showing your support. I really appreciate it. That's my story. All the people helping us when we're running on fumes, hopefully before we get to that point. Um, I think everyone in this room is an activist in one way or another. And we rely on the history of mentors and uh, examples. So before I introduce our final speaker, I just want to um, offer a moment up to honor one of our activists who passed away today. Um, Brother Pete Thompson left us. So we could just have a moment of silence for Pete. Thank you. I know Pete exhibited courage and resistance at many points throughout his life. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the project director of our host organization to come up and speak about the case of Chelsea Manning, whose conscious actions exposing US atrocities has led to a 35-year sentence in the military prison. Jeff Patterson also led the campaign supporting Lieutenant Aaron Watada, who in 2006, a local boy, called out the naked emperor and refused to participate in an illegal war. 15 years earlier, Jeff himself made history when as a young Marine at Kaneohe, he refused to be deployed to Iraq. He sat down on the tarmac Jeff knew at that time he had supporters in the community, but at that moment he was alone and exposed, sitting on the runway, surrounded by armed men who were ready for war and probably really pissed off at him. So welcome to another courageous resistor, Jeff Patterson. for having me tonight. Um, Nancy kind of touched on it. I'm project director of Courage to Resist. We're a, it's 
hard to imagine, but it's been 10 years. We've been doing this work for 10 years supporting war resistors, conscientious objectors, and now we've expanded our role to cover people in the military who are facing repercussions for uh, speaking out, uh, whistleblowers. And that uh, obviously, uh, probably first class of Manning uh, sort of pushed us in that direction. Um, next. As Nancy mentioned, 25 years ago this fall, one quarter of a, a century, um, I was stationed in County Oe like uh, Lieutenant uh, Jacob back there. Uh, I was not a lieutenant, I was just a artillery uh, corporal. Um, I, had, I had my own crew of peons to yell at and order around and people yell at me all the time. Um, and I spent years in uh, Korea uh, and Okinawa in Japan and uh, mainland Japan and the Philippines. And when I got to Hawaii, it was, it was amazing because uh, there wasn't the, the overwhelming sense of poverty and desperation and oppression that I saw in those countries. And it took a while uh, for me to realize uh, the injustices uh, that were uh, going on right behind the facade of Waikiki and the bright lights. Um, I was a artillery controller. I was a, uh, went to a special school, uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical. But my job was to assemble uh, the fuses on the tactical nuclear warheads uh, we used in our, our artillery, the 198 millimeter artillery. And I was getting ready to deploy uh, when Iraq invaded uh, Kuwait. I was packing my bags like the rest of them um, until our company commander um, explained that if anything went wrong in Iraq, it would be my job to set the fuse so we could nuke all the ragheads. And um, there were other people in the room uh, with me and they all started jumping up and down, shouting, kill the ragheads, <laughs> like Marine Corps grunting. And I realized I did not belong. I did not want to uh, set any nuclear fuses. I didn't want to set, do any of that. And then if I, re and I realized if I didn't want to do that, why would I want to simply shoot my regular cannon with regular high explosives on people? And if I was questioning that, why would I raise my rifle to shoot somebody in the head? I filed for a conscious objective discharge. Uh, a few weeks later, the military explained that I was sincere. I was sincere, uh, but not sincere enough. Uh, they uh, marched me out to the, the airstrip at Kaneohe, uh right there. And, uh, there's an action shot of me uh, literally uh, sitting down. And uh, that's only because I kept explaining to people, I'm not going, I'm not going. And they're like, yeah, yeah, just keep walking. And that's, I'm a few feet from the steps of the airplane at that point. <laughs> so, and that's my daughter, Claire. So you have to put up with her. <laughs> um, and then they stripped me of my uniform and they're uh, in the, the investigating uh, officer there is uh, showing me the planes leaving and he's calling me a coward and there's and, uh, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and, but they gave me one last, uh, one, one last chance. If I just got on the plane, um, they wouldn't kill me uh, when they returned from Iraq. They wouldn't hunt me down. Um, I, I, they haven't hunt me down yet. I'm just, uh, I'm not that hard to find. Anyways, um, so 25 years ago. And the point of that is like, well, really, it's, you know, what have you done lately? Um, that's sort of the question I like to ask, with, ask myself every now and then. Um, so next slide. Um, so lately, as of 10 years ago, I helped start this organization called Courage to Resist. You try to use my experiences uh, fighting the military, uh, but I never fought alone. I had people like Liz in the back there uh, chanting outside of Kaneohe, uh, uh, doing songs and stuff for me. And it didn't take a whole lot, but it took a few people to inspire a few other dozen people, and then maybe a hundred or so people got together. And that was enough to scare the hell out of the military that there would be a hundred uh, people here on Oahu that were uh, uh, standing up for uh, resistors and they remembered uh, what happened here in this very church during the Vietnam War uh, when people refused to uh, deploy to, um, or be uh, drafted or deployed to Vietnam. And that was enough for me to not be sentenced to five years in prison, but for, to be released uh, time served. And I tried to uh, take those lessons and these are some of the 200 uh, people I can publicly uh, point to 
uh, that uh, Courage to Resist has uh, worked with over the last 10 years, people who spoke out against Iraq and later Afghanistan. Um, we kept many of them from going to prison. Uh, we didn't keep all of them from going to prison. Uh, but when they went to jail, it wasn't because they didn't have a quality uh, legal uh, team. It wasn't because they didn't have support. Uh, simply the military hated them uh, more than we could muster uh, support. Um, next slide. And up until 2006, we were a relatively community-based uh, volunteer organization. Uh, when uh, Lieutenant Aaron Matata, a uh, native of Oahu, came to us in Oakland and said he had a plan, he wanted us to help him unfold that plan, uh, publicly uh, speaking out and explaining how the, the war in Iraq was uh, illegal. Um, that, and at the same time, we had other uh, resistors uh, facing long uh, prison sentences. We knew that uh, we had to become more of a, a full-time organization and uh, and since 2006, working with Aaron, and I relocated to uh, Washington State uh, to work with him for a few months. And I've been a full-time uh, organizer, traveling um, for Courage to Resist uh, since then. And we've sent uh, attorneys and activists to uh, Japan and to the Philippines and to uh, uh, Kuwait, um, to Germany. Uh, to work with uh, U.S. objectors who uh, were uh, working and uh, speaking out and refusing to fight, and, as well as Canada. Uh, but it was uh, obviously uh, very proud of Aaron, and despite his actions, uh, it's important to realize Aaron, uh, because of the community support and because of a um, uh, fantastic attorney, Eric Seitz uh, from Honolulu, um, Eric never spent a day in jail. Some of the cases we're working on today, um, Andre Shepard, uh, just the last week, we have conflicting uh, uh, opinions from the European Union and the Germany High Courts regarding this U.S. Uh, soldier who has been uh, seeking uh, political asylum in Germany uh, for, uh, since 2006, a long time. Um, Germany obviously um, found that the Iraq war was illegal, and that's a, a, a legal settled question. However, there is immense pressure uh, from the United States government to not, <laughs> to not give political asylum uh, to Andre. And so this case simply goes around and around and around, and he has been living in this uh, legal limbo. Uh, and he's been doing so much like the over 100 uh, U.S. service people that still reside in Canada who uh, sought refuge there uh, during the last 10 years. Kimberly Rivera was one case that we lost. Uh, she was deported uh, from Canada uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, she was sentenced to a year in prison. Uh, while she was in prison last year, she had to give birth, uh, shackled to a hospital gurney. Um, all this uh, for somebody who took her husband and kids to escape uh, returning to Iraq and, and seeing the death and carnage. Um, but we also win some. Uh, Sarah Benning, a resistor um, that had gone AWOL uh, four or five years ago and didn't go to Canada, didn't go to Germany, but simply lived among us and actually became an activist herself in the anti-war movement. Um, she faced a decade in, in prison for two counts of desertion. However, our legal team and her supporters in Colorado uh, won her uh, time served and now she's free and moving on with her life. And you can see uh, Sarah on the left is Sarah in the military, Sarah on the right, Sarah not in the military, and I can tell you she's much happier on the right. Uh, next slide. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the, the fight to uh, save uh, private first class, former private first class man. Uh, next slide. Briefly, um, I'm not sure I'm telling anybody anything new, uh, Private Manning. Uh, was uh, uh, tried uh, for providing uh, the WikiLeaks website uh, a number of important documents, and when I say a number, a quarter million. Um, one of them uh, being uh, the collateral murder uh, video of here, uh, Reuters journalists and their bodyguards and some uh, local community members um, are being uh, gunned down by two Apache helicopters. Um, the people who then tried to save the lives of the wounded uh, um, uh, 
people. All right. So there, so the Reuters journalists are wounded. A local, a makeshift ambulance comes to try to pick them up, put their dead, uh, put their uh, bleeding uh, bodies into the, the the local ambulance, and then the Apaches then obliterate uh, the ambulance as well. Um, and that shocked a lot of people. Uh, next slide. Manning was also uh, charged with the Iraq war logs and the Afghan war diaries. And these were uh, many, a quarter million, um, battlefield reports, simply a, 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 maybe a lieutenant uh, bridge walking around uh, Afghanistan. Something happened, and he just jots down what happened. A uh, bad guy came, we killed him. Uh, maybe a bad guy got in the way, he's dead too. We don't know if he was a bad guy or not. And that's literally it. So you have these quarter million uh, entries in that. But from there, uh, well, the importance of that is, is that for the first time, thousands of Iraqi families knew what happened uh, to their loved one who went out for uh, milk or to give water on a particular day in a particular region and simply disappeared. Um, and for the first time, thousands of uh, collateral damage, uh, casual, civilian casualties uh, were accounted for in these documents that had never been accounted for uh, before. And it also, uh, Manning released the Afghan war, or I was going to say, uh, what's missing here is um, uh, the, the, Guantan the Guantanamo files. And these were assessments of the Guantanamo detain detainees. And for the first time, uh, we had proof that most of the detainees at Guantanamo were not the worst of the worst. And that the U.S. actually believed nearly half of them to be innocent of any crimes, but they were simply being held because we didn't know where else to put them. And for we had these assessments of interrogators who believed people to be innocent, but still were tortured anyways because that was the orders from above. Um, so anyways, this greatly helped uh, the attorneys that were working uh, for these detainees to ever find justice. Now for the first time, they could actually talk about the names of these people, because they were classified and secret before, for example. And additionally, uh, Manning released the State Department cables, and, and in large part that incurred uh, the wrath of one Hillary Clinton, who has not forgiven uh, Manning yet. Um, Next slide. I put this up there because based on this is why I became involved and agreed to a work uh, for Manning. And this was a chat log uh, with the person who eventually turned Manning in to the FBI. And this is the FBI informant asked Manning, uh, why did you do these things, provide these documents to WikiLeaks? And Manning's reply. God knows what happens now, hopefully worldwide discussion, debates, and reforms. If not, we're doomed as a species. I will officially give up on the society we have if nothing happens. The reaction to the video gave me immense hope. I want people to see the truth. Um, and here basically sums up uh, why Manning uh, basically knowingly uh, forfeited uh, his, his life, his freedom. Uh, to provide uh, the American people um, these uh, documents. And you can say, that's crazy. Knowingly forfeited your life. Um, and that is crazy. And it's so crazy that is um, an idealistic thing uh, that uh, people do. People, uh, young people do idealistically crazy things all the time, like joining the United States Marine Corps, uh, as me and Jacob. <laughs> Uh, next slide. Um, and Manning was right, to some degree. Uh, the State Department cables did help fuel the Arab Spring. Uh, they did uh, help unravel the story behind uh, Guantanamo. And they did um, uncover all these back, uh, these back channel uh, double dealings that the State Department was, be was uh, doing with these different countries meaning they were telling uh, the people of these countries one thing and they were doing something uh, completely different. For example, in Haiti, uh, they were trying to block uh, increasing the minimum wage while publicly saying that they didn't care one way or the other. 
but the State Department was clearly uh, taking this side of U.S.-based uh, textile companies to keep wages uh, suppressed in Haiti. Uh, next slide. Uh, Manny was arrested in May 2010. Uh, shortly thereafter, transferred to Quantico. Uh, that's when our support group uh, was formed and we started protesting at Quantico. Um, but at Quantico, he was subjected uh, to uh, torturous conditions. Uh, she didn't see the, the light, uh, the sun, uh, for weeks at a time. Uh, she was forced to uh, stand naked uh, while guards screamed at her. Um, and when she reacted, they punished her uh, for reacting in a non-military manner, for example. Um, next slide. And it was only because of oh, really amazing efforts, nearly a million people around the world took action, signed petitions. Uh, there was internal debate within the administration itself. Uh, P.J. Crowley was the Assistant Secretary uh, of the State Department for Public Affairs. Uh, had to resign after criticizing uh, his boss, Hillary Clinton, and, uh, and the president for treating Manny in an illegal manner. Um, United Nations uh, head investigator torture, Amnesty International, uh, all of those and protests around the world. Uh, we were able to win uh, Manning's uh, humane treatment uh, pending trial. And this was before she was found guilty of anything. Next slide. The court martial of, uh, of U.S. Private First Class Manning. Um, we assembled a, a team of activists uh, to move uh, to Fort Meade, uh, home of the NSA, and lived there for much of a year as the proceedings uh, went on. This allowed us uh, to have a, a, a protest every single morning uh, before the trial, uh, starting at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m., to try to pack the courtroom. Um, throughout the night, um, then write up um, our summation of what happened um, that evening and then post it that evening in order to help fuel uh, people's awareness of the trial. Uh, the military uh, was, doesn't allow any recordings of any kind, so our support network hired uh, professional transcribers uh, to sit uh, there every day and to actually transcribe everything that occurred. Wow. And, and to provide that uh, to uh, the media outlets, because media outlets actually didn't have the energy to do that kind of real work themselves. Um, and it was expensive, like $100,000. Um, just a couple of highlights uh, that I enjoyed uh, from sitting there uh, in the shadow of the NSA, uh, watching the, uh, the military um, try a private first class manning. And I would say the military didn't really call the shots. Uh, behind the military prosecution team uh, were rows of people every day that represented the State Department, the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, and other acronyms that nobody had ever heard of or officially didn't exist. Um, and notes went back and forth uh, between the people that were really calling the shots up to the military uh, prosecutors. But um, here are mine, Dan Ellsberg. Uh, the leaked the Pentagon Papers. Uh, he's being uh, <laughs> dragged out of the courtroom after he simply reached over to uh, shake uh, uh, Private Manning's hand during a recess. Um, and there, uh, Private Manning is pointing to the size of his cell as it was marked out on the court uh, ground there and how his bed was. And uh, Manning was explaining how that if he was sleeping, her head turned away from the guard, that the guard would start banging uh, the nightstick on the, on, the, on the cell in order to wake her up and to ensure that she was okay. So imagine somebody doing that uh, throughout the night as you try to sleep with all the lights on uh, and for doing that for weeks at a time, then months at a time, and being uh, you know, uh, forced to stand naked during the day that's sort of a brief description of what she uh, was subjected to. Um, and then during um, all this time, supporters, uh, this is the first day of the actual trial, uh, we all wore truth t-shirts uh, because we wanted to underscore that this was about the truth. Uh, Manning 
uh, risking everything to provide the American people the truth. Uh, but we were ordered uh, to turn our uh, truth uh, t-shirts uh, inside out because it's inappropriate to try to influence the court uh, with this message of truth. Um, so uh, that, that's me on the far right. I, I don't think I look like that. <laughs> we couldn't really afford a, a really expensive artist. Um, next. On Fort Meade, um, they had never seen anything like it. We organized a demonstration of well over a thousand people. Um, and this is on Fort Meade property. And this was uh, without permission uh, from uh, the, the, the general of Fort Meade. Uh, this was daring uh, the local police to enforce uh, these ambiguous laws of public streets and public sidewalks on technically military uh, uh, property with signs that say no uh, trespassing and no protest. Um, and yet we still were able to gather well over a thousand people. Um, and this is just one day of um, us assembling uh, before the trial uh, with our uh, truth shirts uh, representing uh, uh, Manning as everybody goes in through the front gate to work. Um, and we did that day after day. Next slide. And meanwhile, Thousands of people around the world, including uh, here in Honolulu, uh, took action. Um, and this is a uh, San Francisco Pride. Uh, we organized uh, the, uh, the Manning contingent. It was one of the largest uh, Pride uh, contingents ever in the history of San Francisco Pride, which is the wow. largest Pride uh, parade and festival on earth. Uh, next slide. And what did we get for all that? <laughs> Manning faced over 140 years. Um, the judge found Manning guilty of illegally, uh, the judge found the military guilty of mistreating uh, Manning uh, in violation of Article 13 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Um, she also convicted him of violating the Espionage Act and nearly all other offenses. Um, however, she was acquitted of aiding the enemy, which was a great victory for us. That was a death penalty offense there. Um, Manning was sentenced to 35 years in prison, about 12,750 days. Um, the judge could have reduced that sentence by 100% based on the military's uh, torture of Manning. Uh, instead, she chose the arbitrary number of 112 uh, days. This is very important because the military is basically being given permission here to arrest a soldier, torture that soldier if, as long as they believe that they can get a long prison sentence at the end of the day, there's no, re there's no real repercussions for mistreating and torturing a soldier in their custody. Um, if they can get 50 years at trial and then assume maybe they'll get one or two years knocked off, basically the whole protection against uh, illegal pretrial punishment goes out the window. And we think that's an important issue that uh, is going to be cent central in the upcoming appeals. Next slide. Um, Chelsea E. Manning. Um, obviously, many of you probably noticed how I switched uh, pronouns <laughs> throughout, my, throughout my talk because up until this point, uh, we were dealing with a, a person who identified as a, a, a young gay male, young man. Um, and that's how I became, that's how I got to know her. Um, the day after sentencing, um, she released a statement. Um, as I transition into this next phase of my life, I want everyone to know the real me. I am Chelsea Manning, I am female. Given the way I feel, I have felt since childhood, I want to begin hormone therapy as soon as possible. I hope that you will support me in this transition. Now as activists, uh, we, just, we just spent tens of thousands of dollars doing a video with uh, Oliver Stone and uh, Hollywood celebrities about we're Bradley Manning. Um, we just made a bunch of t-shirts, I am Bradley. Um, and um, this was not a shock. Um, 
but um, she wasn't planning on doing that at that time. Um, but when she got to Leavenworth, uh, the guards and the, and the facility there at Leavenworth just told her straight up, they don't want to hear anything about this gender nonsense. We heard the rumors. Uh, you're a guy, you're going to be treated like a guy, that's it, you're not going to get any special treatment. Uh, so that's her reacting uh, to that, and uh, basically, uh, you know, a call for help uh, uh, from us. Um, next slide. I didn't know what the title of this, uh, everything I, I wrote as a title didn't seem right, uh, so I put gender react. Um, a lot of activists are not comfortable with uh, the issue of, of, um, of trans persons in general. Um, I have had no personal experience myself uh, before uh, getting to know uh, Chelsea uh, a few years ago now. Um, but what I can tell you is that it's all part of the same package. Uh, the same idealistic young person who gave up her freedom to provide the American people with information to make a more informed judgment about U.S. foreign policy and to do that knowing the repercussions and to say hell with it I have to be true to my ideas and myself I'm going to do it. That's the same person who looked within her and said I have to be true to myself tell the world that I feel um, I'm a woman and I want to go down that path to explore uh, those options. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union is doing a fantastic job of representing her pro bono in regards to all of her uh, gender related issues and that frees us up, the, the support network, to uh, gather all of our resources at the upcoming actual appeals in military court that are going to be challenging her 35 year sentence. She has legally changed her name, Chelsea Elizabeth Manning. Um, so, like, we see that all the time on blogs, like, her name's still Bradley. Well, no, it's not. Her name's Chelsea, and we have court documents to show it. Um, and this has been a very busy month for us. Uh, last week, the U.S. Army Court of Criminal Appeals has ordered uh, the military to stop using any male pronouns regarding the upcoming appeals process. Um, and last month, uh, Chelsea uh, began uh, hormone uh, uh, therapy treatments at Fort Leavenworth uh, for the first time after uh, the ACLU sued uh, the military to give her gender appropriate uh, health care. And very interesting, right? The first uh, soldier, the first military service person in the history of the US military uh, to undergo uh, uh, gender related health care treatments. Um, technically, because uh, Manning is in the military, uh, and the military has decided to incarcerate her for these three and a half decades, the military can't shirk their responsibility for uh, ad adequate uh, health care. Um, and this is part of that adequate uh, health care. Next slide. The upcoming appeals process is not just a rubber stamp. Uh, we are very excited to uh, go into at least a dozen major deficiencies of law that uh, Colonel Lynn, the original trial judge, uh, obviously, she knew she was not doing the right thing, but she was going to give uh, the prosecution and all the bosses uh, what they wanted at the end of the day. Um, given that, trying to get to that outcome, she had to skirt the law in many different places. Um, we have hired a new legal team to handle those appeals. Uh, the legal team of Nancy Hollander and Vince Ward out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, is now going over uh, the trial record, the largest trial record of any U.S. military case in the history of U.S. military law, which means that's a lot of paper. Uh, I have a copy in my closet in the office, and it takes up most of my closet. Um, this stage is the most important because unlike in the civilian world, we can't raise any new issues down the road. Uh, we have to uh, take every possible angle and have the best argument uh, before this upcoming hearing. 
Um, otherwise, we'll be precluded from raising it uh, later down the road. There will be other uh, appeals um, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, but this is the most important uh, because this, um, one, is they have to hear the case. Um, two, is that they have, uh, this uh, level of appeal has the ability to reduce the sentence by uh, any amount uh, they deem appropriate. Um, and that's Nancy Hollander. That's not her best photo, uh, but that is her traveling uh, through Spain uh, with a, uh, on a tour organized by Amnesty International to uh, uh, promote uh, Chelsea's uh, case around the world. Uh, next, next slide. And Amnesty International has taken a, a fantastic uh, lead on this case, as well as the ACLU. Um, and uh, with their help, we are generating tens of thousands of letters uh, to President Obama uh, every, uh, every day or every week, uh, calling for clemency for President Obama to reduce uh, Manning sentence. But realistically, we're hoping that when uh, President Obama is leaving office, He'll have to at least think about uh, signing the, part the pardon or the clemency order uh, for Chelsea Manning while he probably signs off on a bunch of Democratic donors you know, <laughs> busted for tax evasion, yeah. right? Um, but with Amnesty International's help, we're actually generating tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of those letters. So I think it's not, it's a futile, I don't know. Uh, it's a chance, and we're about taking every chance uh, we have. Next slide. Um, another uh, local uh, individual. Um, Chelsea spent, I think, her fifth uh, birthday behind bars in December, and uh, Edward uh, just sent uh, this message along with uh, many other sort of not notable people. Um, happy birthday, Chelsea Manning. I thank you now and forever for your extraordinary act of service. I put that in there because most people are like, what's that? What's Snowden think about that? So, here it is. That's what Snowden <laughs> That's thinks about it. Uh, right. I, I like Snowden. I think he's a good guy. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, and what's Chelsea doing? I can't tell you what her uh, official job in the Fort Leavenworth uh, prison is. I can tell you that at first she had a really crappy job that was making her miserable. Now she has a, a job that is sort of a, more of a nine to five. It's, it's not making her miserable. Um, and she's being treated uh, uh, pretty well uh, by the guards. Uh, her main complaint is that sometimes people you know, refer to her as he, uh, and they whisper behind her back about this or that. Uh, but she's not been subjected to any violence uh, or mistreatment, and she has really no complaints in that. Uh, the support network is uh, helping her fund a correspondence course uh, through a, uh, a, a college. But think about this, she has no internet access, uh, but she's taking a correspondence course on the internet and, uh, and computer networking, uh, all via uh, pencil and paper and book. Um, but when she's not doing that, uh, she's actually uh, writing some really good stuff. Uh, she's uh, been published in the New York Times, uh, the UK Guardian, and a couple of lesser uh, newspapers. Um, I, I'm very, um, I think her piece yesterday was probably her uh, best article. She was uh, published in the UK Guardian uh, yesterday, uh, calling on the CIA torturers and the leaders who approved their actions uh, to face uh, the law. Uh, basically, she's like, I face the law. <laughs> what about them? Um, and she's also um, taking her sort of background intelligence analyst to talk about uh, ISIS. Um, and the fog machine and the war and how related to how uh, the military uh, basically corralled uh, journalists in Iraq and Afghanistan to report what, she, what they want uh, to have reported, not the truth. Um, so anyways, she's not going, she's not going away anytime soon um, and she's uh, just agreed to be a, a regular contributor uh, for the UK Guardian. And all these articles can be found online. Next slide. Um, on the UK Guardian, but uh, if you're ever looking for a one-stop what is happening with Chelsea, chelseamanning.org, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, we are uh, Save Manning. Um, <coughs> this is a screenshot from this afternoon 
uh, updated uh, every two or three days. Uh, and you also uh, get t-shirts, posters, stickers, buttons, whatever swag you're looking for. And I brought some examples in the back there you can take home tonight. Next slide. The big question, do we abandon her now? What do you think? No. Yes, no. Next slide. <laughs> and that's why I'm going to finish off with, we raised $1.5 million in the, in the trial and, uh, and that part to, for attorney's fees, half a million dollars, uh, public relations to get her published. Um, and that took a lot of work and a lot of people donated a lot of money. And I imagine, I guarantee you, it's people in this room. It's harder now. Uh, the trial is not coming up. Um, we're looking at this sort of extended appeals process. We're looking at people who supported Manning but were freaked out about the trans issue, sort of like walking away. Um, all this is a pitch. Um, I think Manning is uh, worth getting up advocating for. <coughs> I'm, I'm hoping that people will continue uh, supporting uh, her in related to other issues, and I hope that uh, you'll consider uh, making a tax deductible uh, donation uh, tonight, via check or uh, cash or whatever. We probably should have a basket at this point. Imagine there's a basket floating around. Um, I'll give all the money to Liz. She's very trustworthy. Um, Liz is right back there. Um, I don't see anybody with a hat I can borrow. Right, let's give money to Liz. Um, Donations are tax deductible because the legal expenses are only one of the aspects of the work we do. We also do public education. Um, if people are out there saying, I hate activists, I just want to give money to lawyers, we can do that for you. You can just give the money straight to the lawyers. But it won't be tax deductible. It's a, a trade-off. Um, or go online, chelseamanning.org uh, slash donate. Uh, next slide. I wasn't even sure. That, that was the last slide. All right. Uh, one back. All right, keep that up. All right. Again, 25 years, a, a long journey for me. It's a privilege to be uh, back here at the Church of the Crossroads. It's a privilege uh, to be part of this community, even if it's a very, very extended way via Facebook and all this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, thank you for coming tonight. And, um, I want to call up uh, Jake and Kyle, and uh, we want to take just any questions you have before we close out the evening. Testing one, two. and uh, solitary confinement uh, must have had some psychological damage. Is Chelsea uh, getting any uh, kind of psychological help? She, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is those are uh, military psychiatrists. Um, and the complicated answer is that she thinks that they've really helped her. Um, and that those psychiatrists actually started seeing her while she was being tortured, and, uh, and a couple of them were forced to uh, leave that base because they kept advocating against what was happening to her. Um, so she's run into uh, uh, mental health professionals in the military that she despises, that were complicit with the torture, and then there was others that uh, tried to stand up and have since been helpful in her recovery as well. Yeah, 
Well, we, we did issue a, a press release, you know, General Petraeus just took a, you know, basically he, for his own benefit, gave uh, classified information to his mistress, uh, who was writing his biography, um, and in exchange for uh, giving away these classified information, uh, you know, for this, for this, for this uh, motivation, right, to, you know, endear himself to his mistress, um, he was given uh, probation, um, and basically a sweetheart uh, deal. Uh, you know, PFC Manning uh, admitted at trial that she released these documents, and she explained why she did that. Um, so her motivations were never on in doubt, even from the prosecution side. But the prosecution never offered a deal. Um, I can tell you that the 35-year sentence that she received was far less than the offer the prosecution ever extended to her in the first place. Um, I, you know, I, I expect her to write an article about that, <laughs> but obviously it's, it's, a, it's a double standard, right? The general gives secrets to his mistress, the private gives uh, classified information to the public for public benefit. Uh, one you know, gets slapped on the wrist, one goes to prison for most of their life. I have a question if no one else is going to. I have a question uh, about the uh, conscientious objector kind of reasons. And I'm a conscientious objector, but from a far bygone era of the Vietnam War, when there was a draft on. So what I hear from a lot of old guys, because I'm an old guy and sometimes we hang out together, is that, hey, you know, it's a volunteer army. I mean, you knew what the deal was. You signed up. A deal is a deal. Um, how do you how do you counteract that? And that question is to all three of you. I, uh, the best response I've had with that is um, closer. Yeah. Is uh, you. you know people get married all the time. Um, and they don't get married with the intention of getting divorced generally. So I kind of like it to that. It helps put it into a frame. People understand. You know, I was 18 when I went to college. I didn't do much heavy thinking about it. I was 22 when I commissioned. And then three years later, you know, from 22 to 25, I did a little bit of growing up. My perspective changed. Um, I think most people will admit that they change a good deal in their 20s and even in their late teens. When I frame it that way, people generally understand. But most people don't, they don't know that it's a volunteer military, and then in the middle you can decide you're a conscientious objector. It definitely yeah. sounds bizarre, um, and most people are confused by that. They, mostly they don't even know that it's an option. Right, um, right. And then when they do know that it's an option, obviously the question that gets asked is, well, why did you join? You know, and that's where people generally get a little heated, but I explain to them, like I just explained to you, the marriage and divorce scenario generally helps explain it, and then also I was a kid, I did a little growing up, a little changing. Thank you. Kyle, um, Well, I mean, I think, you know, we, we've noticed with the, um, the downturn in the economy, uh, that the recruitment is, is uh, increasing again, and it's you know, we call it a poverty draft because it's, it's the inner city uh, areas, uh, the, the, the poor students that um, often join because they don't feel like they have other choices. Right? It's like they need to do something, they don't have the money for college, uh, recruiters are pushing them really hard you know, and offering them that option and just going kind to of roll the dice and try to, try to do it. So. Um, I think that's a, a big concern is that there's not information for students to make informed choices. Uh, you know, the, the recruiters have um, sort of privileged access to the schools. That they they can pull students out of classes sometimes, you know, sort of two-on-one, uh, put a lot of pressure on them. Sometimes, uh, and, and also they have access to the lists, right, of, of students. So this is one, one thing that we've been working on. Um, under the No Child Left Behind Act, uh, any school that receives federal federal funding has to uh, make their student roster available to the military recruiters or lose their funding. The only um, way out of that is if the student or their parent uh, requests to opt out of that list. Um, but the, the Department of Education is responsible for notifying students that they have that right. And they've been very uh, derelict um, in, our, in all the years that it's happened. Um, and so in some years we've been able to push and uh, 
you know, organize other students to, to do some outreach. Um, and when uh, it's, it's hit the news and students know that they have that option, uh, it's increased the, the level of students opting out. Um, one year, uh, the Department of Education here um, decided that um, reading, a close reading of the law said that the students may request to opt out. So that meant that um, they, they gave the option to the students in their homeroom. They, everyone had a form and they could opt out. The numbers jumped like... Wow, sure. Like, yeah, a, a hundredfold uh, increase or something. It was just it was incredible because students just didn't know that they one, could. their privacy was being violated in some way, and two, that they had the power and the right to, to request out. It's kind of sort of backslid in, in recent years under the, the new administration, so we've been pushing again for that to be strengthened. The other thing that happens that was another loophole that we found was um, the ASVAB test, uh, Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. So it's a, it's a free um, uh, career aptitude test that's administered by the military. Um, a lot of schools like it because they don't have to pay for, for it, but uh, the default option is that all those scores and the contact information goes to the recruiters. And so um, that was one way that students' names were getting to recruiters, even though the parents opted out of that, the other list. Um, so far, uh, we, we did a campaign around that. We got the, the DOE to clamp down. So now the, the default for Hawaii's Department of Education is that no information is released unless the student or parent requests it. So I, I think that's still holding as far as we can tell. It's not an official policy, but it's become part of the practice. I just want to say, you know, if we if we hope for a better world, if a better world is possible, people are going to have to change, and that includes people in the military. The mil people sure. in the military today are going to have to change to be part of that better world. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we have friends that are so pretentious that they were born perfect and knowing all things, uh, but some of us have to experience things, see for our own eyes to believe it, and then react and, and change to adapt. So, uh, that, I guess that's my answer. Uh, sure. Thank you. Question? Yes, ma'am. Right. Uh, and, and also, thank you for, first of all, uh, doing this on behalf of my trans sister, Sally Manning, because, you know, a lot of times we feel that the non-trans community doesn't understand us at all, but it's good to see. So I'm encouraging support there, first of all. Uh, my question here, all three of you, but, uh, you know, I think Kyle might know the history more than anything. This being the 70th anniversary of the uh, fire bombing of Tokyo, I think it was seven wow. years ago today, uh, General Curtis O'Neill uh, did that war crime and he was punished by being promoted to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So, but uh, along that same analogy, is anything being done to try to hold those responsible for crimes like the collateral uh, murder that we saw in the video, those people in that, in that helicopter crew? And maybe also the tortures of Private Manning. Uh, you know, to bring, at least to have them, their names be brought to the public, the media, to show that uh, they should be held accountable with modern day crimes. Uh, I'm not aware of any, any prosecution of, of those war crimes. I can say the military has cleared itself of all the exact examples. Yeah, yeah. Well, honestly, yeah. you know, they've investigated and they found themselves to have done the right thing uh, yeah. in retrospect. Um, the bigger question is, you know, will uh, George Bush and Dick Cheney ever be held accountable? Right. Um, I don't know. You know, I hope. You know, there's at least maybe they'll not be able to travel most of the world. Um, for example, if they're too afraid to land in Paris or. Brussels or something. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to thank the, uh, the ex uh, Marines because I was myself a Marine back in 72, 73. And I was going into a holding platoon. I was wondering if any of you guys was put into a holding platoon you know, during your time of, I guess, before being released and all of that. Because when I was in the holding platoon, I got a lot of a lot of you know, this intelligent, I got a lot of harassment and stuff and all this belonging stolen and stuff. And I was curious how you were treated. And you were mentioning that you weren't getting too many uh, 
I'm getting, getting kind of snide remarks or looks or stuff like that. I was wondering how they achieved you. Um, Maybe you could also tell people what a holding platoon is because snide is a big that. It sounds to me like it's purgatory. Um, it's news to me. I, I didn't, I'm an officer and generally there's less of us. And as far as I know, and I really have nothing to back this up, I think I might be one of the first Marine officers to file for conscientious objector in a long time. Uh, okay. So they really don't, didn't know what to do with me. If it was an enlisted person, maybe there would be a holding platoon that they could put me in. But for me, they were just trying to find a billet that they could give me. There's, there's no closet to put a lieutenant in. There are billets that they can give him where he can do as little damage as possible, which is kind of what they've been trying to give me, and I'm okay with that. Um, right now, I'm the safety officer, which is, if you think about it, being a safety officer in an organization that promotes violence is a little bit of a bizarre idea. But that's that's where I'm at right now. I think it fits. Um, so no, I haven't been put into a holding platoon and I haven't heard any remarks directly about like, you know, look at him, look at what he's doing. But some people do give me a colder shoulder than they used to. Um, but for the most part, the people that I do work with, they know that I'm still the same hardworking individual. Um, all my friends who were put off at first if at all, know that I still have a sense of humor. It's the same one. Um, and I'm still the same Jake they knew. I'm just being more honest with myself, which generally makes me a better friend, period. Um, so, like I said, I've, I've had a much easier go of it. I think part of that has to do with the fact that I'm an officer and that we do just ge generally, we get treated better. We're, we have much more control over our fate because of the power we're given. Um, I, I think I answered the question there somewhere. <laughs> I was just say, over the years, uh, we've experienced a lot of people in these holding platoons, and a lot of times a regiment will have a a special place where they don't know what to do with basically broken toys. I mean, broken soldiers, <laughs> um, and people languish in these quote unquote holding platoons for months, sometimes over years, and it's a place where nobody will stand up for you uh, because you're sort of on your own. You're being discarded and people are just waiting for paperwork that never comes. Um, at Fort Bragg, uh, we launched, uh, sort of, we hired a uh, journalist to go to Fort Bragg, and do an investigation of the, this holy platoon where they were kept in uh, these uh, squalid barracks where people would simply yell at them because they could. There was no oversight over the sergeants who made these people do their personal errands, uh, yell at them. Um, and it, just, it was just sort of a bizarre thing. That news finally broke, and, and for, for whatever reason, Elizabeth Dole uh, became outraged. <laughs> and uh, she marched down there, and that holy platoon vanished, you know. Um, but it's sort of, you know, unintended. But we were going to keep making a big stink uh, until we closed that. And we did. Um, but there are sort of these places where, uh, you know, it's conscious objectors, it's people who went AWOL, and returned, but the military doesn't want them because they don't believe they're a soldier or a real Marine anymore because they've been away too long. Um, but more often than not, it's people that get injured uh, in, in, at the front or in, in the war. And their injury is sort of in this gray area where they're not good enough to go back into full training, but they're not bad enough to be discharged on medical discharge and they're like, well, let's see what happens to your injury. <laughs> but the injury sometimes festers, you know, for over a year or more in, in, this, in this sort of purgatory. So I would say they exist. Uh, some of them are terrible. Some of them are less terrible. Uh, but they're still an issue today. Yeah, um, this, I guess, question is for Jeff. Um, Chelsea Manning's charged under the Espionage, Espionage Act, I think, of 1917, right, which is the same Thing that Ed Snowden is charged under. Um, Ed Snowden has talked about the possibility of returning to the U.S. to face a trial. Now, in your experience, is there any possibility, one, of an actual fair trial, and two, if, if, the, if the actual process of having a trial may have a, a benefit to uh, America, the public, or, or that sort of thing? Uh, Edward's a smart guy, and he has, he has plenty of uh, uh, attorneys at his, at his realm. Uh, but if he's asking me, I'm saying, 
don't do it. Stay the hell away. You know, there's plenty of countries, you know, hop on, you know, why can't he sneak onto a fishing trawler, right? In, in you know, Moscow Bay or something and sneak out, you know, on some long South Korean voyage in the hole of a, some kind of trawler. Like, good damn, I don't know. Um, uh, those are the things I think about. Um, but why, why are these appeals important? Chelsea Manning is the first person to ever be convicted of giving information to a media outlet um, and to be convicted of the Espionage Act for that. Um, and now it's going to be precedent. The next person, right. like, um, like Edward Snowden, um, the military justice system, civilian justice system, obviously they're separate things, but they reference each other. And, and absolutely, the prosecutors will be arguing for the judge, hey, this has already happened. This is not precedent setting. Um, and that's why our appeals are, are, you know, we can't uh, shirk our responsibility to go up against and challenge this Espionage Act uh, related conviction with everything we have. For, for basically for us and for future whistleblowers. So this is, so supporting Chelsea is really actually supporting a lot more than just Chelsea. Then. That, was... that was a good point, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. We think so. We think so. Um, I, I think there's going to have to be more Chelsea Mannings to provide more right. secrets that right. are going to give us more truth that we're going to have to, um, you know, take action to, to correct. Uh, obviously, Edward Snowden, you know, just, just today, you know, we learned... Uh, that you know the NSA was working for ten years to break you know your iPhone in, uh, encryption yeah. schedule. Um, so you know I just think like when Edward Snowden first released those documents, you know Fox News and I, you know the first day after like, well that's interesting, but it's not really a big deal. Um, just trying to you know blow it to the side and, and focus on his ballerina girlfriend and whatnot. <laughs> but anyways. Uh, Chelsea definitely thinks that um, you know she served a bigger purpose, and she so. is content with being in prison. She's not happy about being in prison, but she's content about where she's at, why she got there. Uh, but she does hope to uh, be free someday to have a life. Yes. Could one of them or all of them explain what the Espionage Act is about? Because what I've heard of it is horrifying. In 1917, uh, the U.S. government realized that they, there wasn't a law against giving away state secrets. Um, so they created the Espionage Act to say, if you give, basically if you're at war with somebody, you give uh, the enemy secrets that are going to hurt our cause, you know, the defense or, or the war preparation effort, that's a bad thing. You're a traitor, and the Espionage Act uh, covers that. Um, and it has been used over the years. Uh, embassy uh, Sergeant Lone Tree, a, a Marine embassy guard in Moscow, uh, traded uh, sex uh, for secrets. Um, people understand that. It's, it's bad. You don't give the, the enemy your secrets. Uh, but what's precedent setting now is that the courts uh, are very happy to now entertain this idea that by giving uh, information that is in the public interest to a media outlet is now the same as giving information uh, to the enemy, and, that, and that's what's uh, that's what we're very uh, concerned about in this particular case. No, that's not what bothered me about the SPR. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I read, and you can correct me on this, is that they don't. The, the government does not have to show that the. The information that was given hurt anybody, hurt hurt our country. They don't have to show that. It's just the releasing of any kind of information makes you guilty. Well, and that's exactly that's the Espionage Act is is a, is a substantial document. Um, there's plenty to be concerned about. Uh, but what he says is absolutely right. For example, and I sat through the trial. Uh, Chelsea Manning was never shown to have harmed anybody. She was shown to have uh, annoyed uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, she was shown to have, uh, you know, annoyed many people in the State Department. But the, the government had never at one point pointed to any person on earth anywhere 
that was actually harmed based on the release of any one of the 250,000 classified documents. And these classified documents, every single one of them is classified on the basis of the question. If this was public, something, somebody would be harmed. So you have 250,000 examples of these documents not mimicking that hurdle. And in fact, it had nothing to do with harm, but possible embarrassment. And possible embarrassment is actually not a reason that they can use to classify documents. So it's sort of a circular kind of argument, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Chelsea didn't actually harm anyone. This whole prosecution of Chelsea proved that the, the classification system is broke beyond repair. Um, and yet, you know, that, that, that hasn't changed, but Chelsea uh, remains in prison. What did she do with, uh, with uh, Hillary? <laughs> what was her dance? Well, Hillary was Secretary of State, so when the, when the State Department cables came out that embarrassed the State Department, Hillary then had to travel to like 37 countries to like hold the hands of all these other ambassadors and say, no, no, we, I know we were talking bad about you, but that's not really how we feel about you. Give me a hug. Um, she got free She got free But it annoyed the hell out of her, right? That wasn't what she was planning on doing. And that's why her State Department people, you know, sat there doing everything they can to put Chelsea away as long as possible. Yes. I was arrested with uh, Dan Ellsberg in 1978 at Rocky Flats. Hey. And uh, he uh, was also charged with the Espionage Act. And if it wasn't for the Nixon dirty tricks, uh, he could have very easily gone to prison for a long time because of that, but he was able to, to go free because uh, Richard Nixon is really the most dangerous man <laughs> in America at that time. Somebody else was more embarrassing <laughs> than Ellsberg at the time. So would you guys like to give some closing thoughts? Uh, unless somebody else has a question, but it seems like a lot of hands up. So. You want to each give some closing thoughts? A surprise. Um, I'll just go with what's on my mind right now. What's on my mind right now, somebody brought up the 70th anniversary of the firebombing of Tokyo. Um, and as I've been going through my mind, of, I'm just looking at assumptions that I've held since I was young and looking at them and throwing most of them out. And one of them is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Did we have to do it? And the question now to me is why did we do it? How is it possible that we made that decision and that it was okay and that we still teach it that way and that the majority of people still believe it? And I think a lot of what we see with the torture program, this is all my opinion again, but with the torture program, that we have politicians that can come out on television and say, yes, I know that the, we tortured people illegally and that it did nothing to help our country, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. And that's just acceptable. Um, to me, it seems like a symptom of a memory or something that's happened that we haven't reconciled yet. And I don't think America's reconciled Hiroshima in any major way. Um, I think it's avoided major controversy somehow for 70 years because I think it's just too ugly for us to really grapple with. And I think until we do, we're gonna keep seeing these incidences where we can't believe it cropping up, where people release the truth um, so that Americans can make informed decisions. The truth hurts nobody. It embarrasses a couple people. It inconveniences the Secretary of State um, and this person goes away for 35 years. Um, again, I think these are all symptoms of something like that. Um, that's what's on my mind right now. And uh, it's just interesting to have to go through all these assumptions and really take a look at who we are, who I am. Um, that's, that's it. Um, well, what's been on my mind lately is uh, Ukraine. I hear the, the drums of war are beating, and I'm really concerned about that because this is also potentially a nuclear um, um, conflagration. Uh, so, uh, and it's all, you know, a lot of it is uh, following the similar pattern of some sort of trumped up uh, accusations. So, you know, it's um, our peace movement has sort of declined in the, in the last 
several years, um, protest fatigue or whatever it might be. So, um, you know, thank you for for all of you coming out and continuing to to keep our courage up and to keep fighting um, the good fight. Um, we need to reach out to more people and, and sort of pay attention to what's happening. You know, um, I think uh, it, it's and, and also churches like Church of the Crossroad have always been a beacon for hope. Uh, in Hawaii, um, I wish more churches would sort of take their uh, peace uh, testimonies uh, to heart and do something about it, yeah. uh, especially when uh, Hawaii is such an integral part of, of the war machine. Uh, we, we have a particular responsibility, I think, here to uh, speak out against these things. Um, and I guess the, 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 the last thing that's on my mind is just um, recently Naomi Klein was in town and uh, spoke about climate change as a, as a sort of game changer. So just how capitalism is sort of reaching the limits of this planet and of our civilization um, and the survival of the planet. And so, you know, maybe that's a, 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 the, the wake up call we need to figure out another way to be in the world. Because um, it becomes an existential problem for all of us at this point, right? So, you know, the old way of doing things, um, the old sort of geopolitics uh, is, is uh, gonna kill us all. <laughs> uh, just to say it's an honor to be up here with Kyle and uh, Lieutenant Bridge. Because um, I, I never got to fraternize with officers before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, seriously, what's on my mind a lot these days is um, in the last few months, uh, literally in the last five months, um, three. Uh, Three Iraq War Afghan War uh, veterans uh, that I worked with, encouraged resist, collaborated with, um, who went to war and who said, you know, I'm going to support resistors because I should have resisted. Um, they they took their lives uh, because they couldn't overcome the demons of, of that, regardless of how much they tried. Um, George Jacob, for example, rode his bicycle 20,000 miles as a way of trying to meditate that out of his mind, and still that wasn't enough. Um, you know, in all our videos at Fort Meade, he was out there leading our protests um, many days. Uh, but, you know, just the demons that he experienced, uh, you know, it just takes one moment of weakness, apparently. Um, so, you know, when people, uh, you know, when people are like, well, can resistors get in trouble for resisting? Yes, they can. <laughs> I can tell you plenty of stories. We actually published a book, uh, Resistors Getting in Trouble for Resisting. Um, but there are thousands of stories, 12 veterans a day kill themselves. Uh, 12 a day. Um, you know, sometimes only 7, but sometimes 14. Uh, but 12 a day on average. Um, and most of them, I believe, would be alive today if they resisted. Yes, they would have been yelled at. Yes, they would have gone to jail. Yes, uh, some people would have thought less of them, but they'd be alive, they'd be with us. Um, so there's two sides. Yes, people can get in trouble. Yes, sometimes I get people in more trouble. Most of the time, no. Most of the time I get people out of trouble. Um, but uh, what are the alternatives? Um, and, and that is one alternative that uh, I keep thinking about. So I appreciate you uh, being here with Chelsea Manning, not being afraid of the issue of, of um, her becoming uh, a woman uh, that's uncomfortable uh, for most people. It would, would have been uncomfortable for me a few years ago. Uh, but if you're going to learn more about that issue, I don't think there's anybody better uh, to uh, learn <laughs> that with than Chelsea Manning. Um, read, her, read her articles. Uh, she's obviously very multidimensional. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that someday trans people will have to be allowed to serve in the military. Uh, that's probably not tomorrow. Uh, uh, but it's inevitable. And in a weird way, uh, Chelsea Manning's treatment today will be part of that uh, journey. Um, but hopefully our military at that point uh, will only serve uh, to protect uh, puppies and kittens and, and good things <laughs> and not oppress people and destroy and kill me. Uh, but uh, those are my parting thoughts. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Church of the Crossroads. Church of the Crossroads, Honolulu, Hawaii. And we'll be signing out soon. Well, Kyle's suggesting, uh, Oops, you know, we, we talk to Chelsea yet. once a week, but we can also uh, send her uh, photos. Maybe uh, we can all, if people want to, just gather again and I'll take a photo. Uh, take, I'll send her a photo.